Okay, we've heard reference time and time again to the importance of South Africa in the original description of Australopithecus and our under current understanding of human evolution. Our next speaker, Dr. Ronald Clark, comes to us from South Africa. Uh, he also has a fairly interesting history. His first degree was in archaeological conservation, and, and then he went out to East Africa where he worked with Louis Leakey, Richard's father, for many years then went back to University College London to get a degree in physical anthropology. And then he's moved to South Africa where he got his PhD at the University of the Waters Rand where he still is today. And he's director of excavations at the Sturkfontein site which has yielded some just extraordinary finds that he's gonna tell us about today. Ron. Thank, thank you. Um, here you see on the title slide, uh, a picture of Australopithecus that not many of you are familiar with because you usually see the famous Mrs. Plez associated with South African Australopithecus. But this is just to show you that we do in fact have some more complete specimens, this one with complete dentition, a, a rather beautiful face. The three major sites in South Africa that have yielded Australopithecus are Taung, and I'll be talking about these in succession, Taung, Sturkfontein, and then up in the north, Makapans Hut. In 1924, a major discovery was made in this limestone quarry at Taung in what was then the northern cape of South Africa. And this is actually a cliff of tufa deposit that built up from an escarpment in the back. And within the, this tufa, this calcareous or limey tufa, there were little cavities that contained uh, infilling. And that infilling was full of bone. And the lime workers, you can see some of them down here, had been blasting back this face of tufa, there is some of the blasted material, and they were developing the limey rock that they obtained from there and throwing away the blocks that contained the fossils. Some of those blocks, however, were on occasion collected by paleontologists during the 1920s, and um, they found their way into museums, some in Cape Town, and then some, one, one skull in particular of a monkey found its way to Raymond Dart at the University of the Witwatersrand. He was interested in obtaining more of them, so he asked a geologist colleague of his, Professor Young, if he could send him some blocks of rock from this quarry and some fossils associated with it. Uh, the blocks arrived and to Dart's surprise, he found this endocranial cast, or brain cast, which he was then able to fit into another block, and here I've reconstructed it. This is a model of it, of, uh, based on Dart's descriptions. He was able to fit it into a block that contained bone fragments. He could see the base of a mandible at the, the bottom of the block, and here the back of a face. When he developed that block, here it is from the other side, the brain cast fitting into the block. When he developed it, he cleaned it out with his wife's sharpened knitting needles over several months, and he uncovered a beautiful little face with teeth that he recognized as being that of a human-like ancestor. He said it was an ape on the way to becoming human, and he gave it the name Australopithecus Africanus in 1925. He noted that the teeth were human-like. It was that of a child. It had mainly milk dentition, but also the permanent first molars. He said the teeth were human-like. It had a very small canine tooth, but it had an ape-like face here with a flattened nose. It had a human-like brow region, but it had a small ape-like brain, not much bigger than that of a chimpanzee. 
but he also deduced that it walked upright from the position of the frame and magnum here. He was criticized by many of his colleagues who said, oh, this is just another ape uh, from southern Africa. But one colleague, Robert Broom, supported him from the beginning. And Broom and Dart both assumed that this little ape man and um, his relatives had lived in these caverns and that they had accumulated the other bones that had been discovered there. But the story was actually more interesting than that. Because many of the bones from that Taong quarry, these monkey skulls here and this one, showed signs, which we only recognized recently, of being attacked by an eagle. So this is damage done by the beak of a large eagle. This is damage done by the beak or the claw. And here you can see also damage, a little hole uh, done by the claw of an eagle. And here is a modern monkey skull for comparison with a similar hole. Here is a modern monkey skull and a modern hyrax skull from beneath a black eagle's nest in South Africa. And that has this same kind of little notch that you see in the skull from Taong. Now, not only that, but the Taong child itself shows damage that's been inflicted by an eagle. So this is the kind of picture we have to have now of how the Tong child came to be in that cavern. It was attacked and taken up there um, as food for the chicks in the eagle's nest. This is a, a bald eagle swooping down on a three-year-old child in New Hampshire in 2001. Now we move to the second of the sites, Sturkfontein. It doesn't look like much from the air. It's this big open quarry region. This is the main, uh, again, a limestone quarry uh, that had been worked in the 1920s and it was still being worked in the 1930s. But there is, in fact, a very large underground system of caves in Dolomite Rock. Here is another view of the Sturkfontein workings. And over there is another famous site called Swatkrans, which contains Paranthropus fossils. But I won't be talking about those today. It was on the 9th of August, 1936, that these students, seen here at Sturkfontein, uh, and in particular Harding LaRiche and GWH Skippers, took Robert Broom to Sturkfontein Caves for the first time. Students are very important. Many of you are here today. And students have been very instrumental in some of the uh, major discoveries that have been made in human evolutionary studies. Harding LaRiche um, is 91 now. He's living in Canada. He, he didn't carry on he, he, his interest in fossils. Uh, he became involved in public health. Uh, GWH Skippers uh, became an expert on the brain and on neuroanatomy, and he contributed to a couple of Robert Broom's volumes on Australopithecus. But on Broom's third visit to Stokefontein on the 17th of August 1936, he made a discovery too of an endocranial cast which he found fitted into a crushed skull with teeth. Here they are. And here they are put together, the teeth, clearly human-like, a very small socket for the canine, and very human-like premolars and molars. And he realized that this was an adult Australopithecus. Here, there he is pointing to the spot where it was recovered. That is Broom's reconstruction, his drawing reconstruction in 1937 of how it may have looked. And this is a later reconstruction in flesh by the Czech artist Burian of how Australopithecus may have looked. In 1938, when he was aged, 19, uh, aged 72, um, Broom said, if I live another eight years, I may be able to do a little more. I think it is very likely that within the next couple of years we shall find other specimens of Pleistocene apes 
and perhaps much of his skeleton. If we could find a pelvis, a foot, and a hand of either the Sturtfontein or Cromdry ape, the importance of the discovery would be greater than all the previous discoveries put together. Now, that is a very bold statement. Greater than all the previous discoveries put together. But Broom knew that the significance of these um, discoveries, that if he could find a pelvis, it would show that they walked upright or not. If he could find a hand, it would show whether they were ape-like or not in their hands. And uh, if he could find a foot also, it would tell us something about their locomotion. Unfortunately, the foot and the hand eluded him. He did find a pelvis many years later, but not the foot or the hand. But after discovering the end of a paranthropus humerus in 1938, Broom wrote, I hope soon to have much of the skeleton, but as the animals have been clearly devoured by large carnivores, we have to be content with fragments. And certainly that was the case until very recently fragments. But in 1947, he and his young assistant, John Robinson, discovered a very fine skull here at Sturtfontein that became known as Mrs. Plez. They discovered other skulls as well, some more fragmentary and this one a little more complete. Uh, and they discovered this one that I showed you earlier with a very fine face. And in subsequent years, excavations at Sturtfontein have revealed more, usually in fragments, which we're able to put together like this, or like this. Here's the, here's the kind of fragments we find. And among them, we have to sort them out. We have to recognize the hominids. And here is part of a hominid radius, you see, put together. We also find partial skeletons. This is the one that Broom and Robinson found in 1947. So Broom was very happy because he, he got his wish. He found the pelvis and it showed that Australopithecus did indeed walk upright. Not exactly like us. Some years later, another partial skeleton was found in the excavations of Alan Hughes and Philip Tobias. Um, here is this pelvis put together. And you can see that it's not exactly like a modern human. It flares out to the side. We have two different kinds of pelvis represented at Sturtfontein. There's this much larger one, which is also a bit morphologically distinct from the smaller one that Broom found. But more about that later. A second species at Sturtfontein. Two different pelvis but there are also two different kinds of skull and dentition. One is tempted to think that maybe we're just looking at males and females, but I don't think so. Because morphologically, they're very different. It's not just a matter of size difference. If you look at the, the form of the skull, this one has a more angled occipital or neck region. This one has a steeper, uh, flatter neck region. This one has a flatter face. This has uh, the cheekbone set back. Uh, this one has a much more massive uh, lower jaw. And this one has a smaller lower jaw. There are various other features, too, that I won't go into now. But there seem to be two distinct species. And if we look at the teeth, this is an Australopithecus africanus mandible. These are some Australopithecus mandibles from Sturtfontein found in more recent years. Look at the size of these third molars compared to that one. Look at the size of these second molars compared to that one. And they are, in fact, particularly this one, as large as one of the largest mandibles of Paranthropus boise from East Africa, the natron jaw. Look at that. This one's as large, if not larger, than the natron jaw. Now we go to the third of the Australopithecus sites in southern Africa, the Makapans Cut Lime Works. Again, exploited by lime workers who were blasting out cave infill, rocky cave infill, that was eventually collected by 
paleontologists who were interested in it in the 1940s. The bones are very prolific. Here you see uh, an example still in the cave wall at Makapan's Cut of a great mass of bones of fossil animals, and these were being blasted out by the lime miners who left them on the ground. In, in the 1940s, Dart, uh, encouraged by his student, Philip Tobias, began exploring these lime works at Makapan's Hut, and he sent two of his uh, uh, workers, James Kitching and Alan Hughes, to spend some time there sorting through the dumps that had been left by the lime miners. Kitching was assisted by two of his brothers as well, and the three Kitching brothers and Alan Hughes managed to obtain quite a nice sample of Australopithecus fossils. But this is it. It's not very large compared to the large number of animal bones which were found from that quarry. Thousands of animal bones, but not very many hominids. It's not as prolific as Sturtfontein. There are, however, some very fine mandibles, and again, an indication that there may be two different species represented there. So here we have the mandible from Makopan's cut with large teeth compa compared to the large-toothed specimen from South Africa, and those two contrast with a smaller-toothed specimen from uh, Sturtfontein. Sorry, that's from Sturtfontein, from Makopan's hut, and this also from Sturtfontein. So you have a large-toothed form and a small-toothed form. Again, in the upper jaw, a large-toothed form from Sturtfontein, look at that molar, compared to a smaller toothed form from Makapan's hut. So suggestions of two different species at both sites. Dart formed the opinion that Australopithecus had been a tool-making hominid, but not a stone tool-making hominid, a bone tool-making hominid. He formed what became known as the osteodontokeratic hypothesis. The osteo, the bone, donto, teeth, and keratic horn. Bone, tooth, and horn, tool-making Australopithecus. And these are some of the bones that Dart illustrated in his book, suggesting that these had been used like daggers, the horns like daggers, the mandibles like saws, and the scapulae or shoulder blades like axes. And he envisioned... Australopithecus as being a violent, bloodthirsty, cannibalistic kind of hominid. He wrote vividly of the blood-bespattered, slaughter-gutted archives of human history. Very dramatic, but very exciting to the man in the street who was to read about this. And it inspired lots of illustrations, like this one by J. Maternus. Of, here is a, an Australopithecus holding a bone dagger. And here are two Australopithecus signs by another artist, Papas, fighting, one with a club and a dagger, fighting his opponent here. Now, we know this today not to be correct. These so-called bone tools were accumulated by hyenas and porcupines. Australopithecus had nothing to do with it but it was very dramatic at the time. Here's another picture by the Czech artist Burian uh, showing Australopithecus with a bone dagger there and erroneously put into a big open landscape. We know too from current research that that was incorrect. Australopithecus lived in a more forested environment. Now if you put suits on these Australopithecines, there they are. <laughs> Um, these are five of the gentlemen who um, were very instrumental in the research at Makapan's Cut. Firstly, Raymond Dart, encouraged by his student, not a student here, this is much later, uh, but, uh, Philip Tobias. And there is Alan Hughes, James Kitching, and Bob Brain, who did stratigraphic research at Makapan's Cut. Bob went on to work at the cave site of Swartkranz, and Alan Hughes and Philip Tobias went on to explore Sturkfontein. 
So let's go back to Sturtfontein. Uh, excavations were started by Tobias and Hughes in 1966, and they've been continuing to the present day. Here you see a profile of the site. So the main area where Broom obtained his fossils was up here near the surface. It's been excavated down from the surface, and hundreds of Australopithecus specimens have come from there. But beneath it, there are two other caverns. One of them that I'll be showing you now, known as the Silberberg Grotto, has yielded from here a nearly complete Australopithecus skeleton. And then this cavern, known as the Jacobet Cavern, yielded from up here in the ceiling and in fallen material beneath it, more Australopithecus specimens. So it's quite a depth of deposit uh, that still has a long way to go in terms of exploration. It's a vast cavern system uh, with a lot of potential. Plenty of work for you students in the future. The, from the Jacobet cavern, up here in the ceiling, came this partial skull, now reconstructed here. And from the floor beneath it, we had a, a very nice femur and a humerus, a vertebra, a clavicle, uh, teeth, oh, and, and a maxilla there. Now, I want to spend a little time on the um, Silberberg Grotto, which is this lowest deposit here. The lowest deposit is known as member one, and it doesn't contain any fossils. Above that is member two that contains the com nearly complete skeleton. Then we have about eight meters of member three, which has not yet been explored because it's difficult of access. Above that is member four, which contains most of the Australopithecus fossils obtained by Broom and by the later excavations of Hughes and Tobias. And then we have member five, which contains some early Homo remains and early stone tools. Here is a model of how it looks in section with vegetation and then the cave and the infills here and beneath it the rest of the cavern system. This is the Silberberg Grotto as it looks today with this member two deposit or talus slope. Here again in the Silberberg Grotto on the wall of the, of the breccia deposit, of the cave infill, you can see the impression left by a huge stalagmite, something like this one, that was removed by lime miners. And in the process, they blasted out some of this breccia, which they left on the floor of the cave. In 1978, it was removed to the surface by means of a winch bucket, and it was put into piles and, and cleaned and put into bags and boxes. 1994, going through one of these bags, I noticed four foot bones of a hominid, of an Australopithecus. Four conjoining foot bones, which when put together lead down towards the big toe. What's interesting about it is that the big toe, as you see in this model, is slightly divergent from the other toes, somewhat ape-like. It differs from that of a modern human where the big toe is lined up with the others. And it is the kind of foot that would have made the footprints that we see at Lytoli in Tanzania. Now, the age of these deposits is um, somewhat disputed, but we currently believe it to be about 3.3 million years old. Some years later, 1997, I found more of the same foot. Here, here are the first four foot bones, and I found more of the same foot and also part of the lower leg. There it is put together, compared to a modern human foot and lower leg. But I also found part of the opposite leg and foot. I gave it to my two assistants, Stephen Motsumi and Nkwani Malefi, and asked them to go into the cave and see if they could find anywhere that might fit on. After one and a half days of searching, they found that little piece of white bone onto which it fitted. We continued to work there. We excavated on this slope. It's over here. And there it is. And there is the original piece that I gave them, fitted on there. The other foot fitted on here. 
We uncovered, it's a concrete like rock, it takes a, a lot of work and a lot of time. We uncovered the lower legs here. And then later, further up the slope, we uncovered initially just the side of a, a jaw and gradually cleaned away the rock and uncovered more of it. Here it is, slowly being uncovered. And there it is, a beautiful skull, and next to it, the upper arm bone or humerus. That's it. Littlefoot, that's not a name I gave it. I'm not keen on these names. I prefer to give them numbers, STW573. Uh, but Philip Tobias gave the name Littlefoot to the first four bones that were found. So that name has stuck. It got into the press. And now the whole skull, this hulking, muscular hominid, has to be called Littlefoot. <laughs> and I'm glad he's not around to hear that. But more was to come. Further up the slope here, we discovered the forearm with a complete hand. The fingers are folded with the thumb across the palm like that. There it is. It's a relatively short arm and a short hand. In other words, it's just like ours. This is exciting because it shows that they didn't have the long ape-like hand. They had a human-like hand. Our human-like hand is used a lot for grasping. It's used for grasping when, when uh, we're holding on to railings or trees. It's used for grasping <laughs> musical instruments, tennis rackets, cricket bats, etc. Uh, that's what it evolved for. It evolved for grasping. The, the long thumb and the relatively short fingers, this opposable thumb, evolved in our ancestors for slow climbing in trees. We also discovered here the pelvis. Unfortunately, it's rather crushed. It still has the femur, the head of the femur, in the acetabulum. And we discovered the right arm and hand, which is also crushed. And then last year, we discovered a complete scapula, here it is compared to that of a human and a chimpanzee. And it has features of both. But sadly, the processes on the scapula are wrapped around the humerus. And that, in turn, is crushed in against the side of the mandible. And in between them is the clavicle which is vertically in place. So it's very, very difficult now to extract this from the concrete-like rock. And uh, what we're doing now is to cut out a much bigger area to try and take this out, to undercut it, and take it to the lab where it can be processed. This is how the skeleton uh, looks with the arm, the left arm above the head. Uh, there's the pelvis. Here are the legs, which are crossed, and the right arm down the side. So it looks like a Scotsman doing the Highland Fling. <laughs> the environment of Littlefoot was very different to the way it is today. It was forested. We know that from the kind of animals we find there. We find a creature called Mahapania, which is like the takin that lives in the foothills of the Himalayas today in woodland. Um, we find a lot of large monkeys of the genus Parapapio, the extinct genus Parapapio, and also large colobus monkeys. We find a lot of carnivores as well. This long-legged hunting hyena called Chasmoporthetes, Megantherian, a saber-toothed cat, and another false saber-toothed cat called Dinophilus. How did Littlefoot get into the cave? Well, several possibilities. Was it, as Gary Larson uh, depicts here, thrown in? The, in this case, it's the Old of I Gorge, but he suggested that Neanderthal mobsters were throwing in the hominids. Was it like Winnie the Pooh, who stood on a piece of ground that had been left out by mistake and plummeted into the depths below? Or was it attacked by a leopard up on the surface and they both fell in together? We know it wasn't killed and eaten 
uh, by a cat because otherwise the bones would have been scattered and we'd find uh, indications of tooth marks on it. Uh, but it could have been attacked on the surface and they both fell to their deaths. There are numerous possibilities. Another possibility. Was Australopithecus, as Dart thought, a killer? Did Australopithecus sometimes prey on members of its own species or related species? Or was early Homo responsible? Did early Homo go back further than we think? And was Homo responsible for killing some of the Australopithecus that we find as fossils in the caves today? This skull here, STW53, is an interesting clue to that. It, it has been put in the literature as Homo habilis. It's not Homo. It's an Australopithecus. It has all the typical features of Australopithecus that you see here in this skull, Mrs. Pleas. And uh, Tim White, uh, Nick Toth, and Travis Pickering uh, published a paper on part of the zygomatic bone on which they found cut marks. Here they are, enlarged. They found these cut marks made by a stone tool, suggesting that it was at least fed upon by some other hominid. Here are similar cut marks on the skull of a chimpanzee from a collection of Liberian chimps. Here is the collection which is now in the, museum, in the uh, university in Frankfurt. Those were collected from the walls of huts of the Dan people in Liberia. And they fed upon these chimps and then kept the skulls as trophies. And they show similar cut marks to those seen on STW 53. So it's an interesting question that we need to debate. There are myths on the origin of human uprightness. Uh, one of the myths is that we came up from a quadrupedal ancestor gradually in a stooped gait like this, and you see this picture depicted often. This is wrong. The other myth is that Australopithecus was running across the open grassland. This is also wrong. The skeleton from Sturkfontein shows that our ancestors had a hand like ours. They didn't have the long arm and the long hand of the apes. The apes walk on their arms because they're long, and so it's easy to, to bend forward and use your arms as props. Our ancestors didn't need to do that. They had short arms, they were upright in the trees, they were upright when they came down to the ground. Also, they didn't run, at least not all of them, because from Sturtfontein, we have, member four, we have two different foot bones leading down towards the big toe. This is the metatarsal leading towards the big toe. Two different foot bones of Australopithecus. Remember I talked about the two different kinds of skull and jaw and teeth. Here we have two different foot bones. This one is more chimp-like. There's a chimpanzee. The... Uh, toe, the big toe could only come back to here. The other one is more human-like. The big toe could flex all the way back to here. So we have indications of two different ways of walking. When we walk, we bend our toe like that. We toe off. Now this particular Sturkfontein specimen could do that. That's not a fossil. That's a, that's a modern uh, uh, chimpanzee toe bone that I put on there just to illustrate the point. But it could come right back to there as in the modern human. This one couldn't. This one would have walked like a chimp. A chimp cannot bend its big toe the way we can. So what makes us human? The opposable thumb, the upright posture, high heels in walking. We lift our heel off of the ground when ladies uh, wear high heel shoes, they're doing that permanently. And big analytical brain, looking at you questioningly. It remains for me uh, to thank you for your attention and also to thank our sponsors for the work at Sturtfontein over many years. Uh, a great many people have contributed to this work. We rely on them greatly and we're very grateful to them. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ron. Um, one of the unfortunate things about this workshop and symposium is that although we have a lot of paleoanthropological talent here for the workshop the rest of the week, we only have space on the, on the podium for, you know, a little over a half dozen people. Um, in order to reap the benefits of all these other people who have come in for the workshop that will follow this, uh, we've set up a couple of panel discussions. So I'd like the people who are set up for the first panel discussion now to come up and take their place on stage and we'll give these people a chance to just sort of, if they'd like to raise some questions, offer some comments on perspectives on what we've heard this morning. And then subsequently we will give a chance to those of you in the audience to raise, to ask questions either of the panelists or of the speakers. So why don't we start by uh, letting the panelists introduce themselves, uh, tell us where you are, a little bit about yourself. Why don't we start at the other end with my colleague, Dr. Larson. Hi, I'm uh, Susan Larson from the uh, Department of Anatomical Sciences here at Stony Brook. I'm Carol Ward from the Integrative Anatomy Group in the Pathology Department at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. Um, I'm David Strait from the University of Albany, also in the State University system, and I'm actually a graduate of Stony Brook. I'm Francis Carrera, uh, one of the TBI uh, postdoc and also a friend of National Museums of Kenya. I'm Zaria Lemsegut from the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Uh, my name is Charles Lockwood. I'm from the Department of Anthropology at UCL, University College London. Um, I'm Andy Harries. I'm at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Um, I'm in medical sciences, but I'm actually a geochronologist. My name is Fred Grind. I'm a professor here in the Department of Anthropology and Anatomical Sciences. And you'll notice from my accent, I'm currently at the Lever Hume Center for Human Evolutionary Studies <laughs> at Cambridge University. <laughs> <laughs> OK, why don't we open it up? If anyone has any, any remarks they'd like to say, about what we've heard this morning or what we haven't heard this morning. Don't be shy. Fred. I'd like to talk about cups and saucers. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that uh, I find interesting in this field is the reluctance of its practitioners to recognize diversity. And I believe that names mean something and that what we're suffering from here is that's my accent. What we're suffering from here, uh, I think, is a reluctance of people who work in the field to recognize the diversity, the phylogenetic diversity that we have with the continuous, continuing use of the same name, Australopithecus. Uh, I believe that not everything is a cup or a mug. And that what we tend to do, I think, is partition the diversity that we have into a group where we talk about a hominin that happens to be bipedal with a small brain and large teeth. But the differences within that group that we would call Australopithecus are greater than the differences morphologically than we have between common genera of apes today, certainly between chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. And it's probably one of the consequences of this is that there's a reluctance of people to be able to get their mind around looking at phylogenetic diversity and also behavioral and ecological diversity if you consider this group to be a mono, monogeneric form. It's a paraphyletic group. It's a biologically meaningless group. Every analysis that's ever been done cladistically of the relationships of these forms show that they do not form a single lineage, as uh, Bill Kimball was talking about, with a unique history. There's a diversity. Some of them are related to others. Some of them are clearly not. Um, and I believe that it's one of the things that we should try to do is to in embrace this diversity. Uh, I have been preaching paranthropists for many years. Uh, at least I'm glad to see that all the students who come out of Stony Brook are not afraid of using the generic name for anthropus, uh, but we've got to, I think, expand that and recognize uh, this diversity. And it's, to me, interesting that the naming of taxa uh, seems to hold 
if you consider, for example, the naming of Australopithecus anamensis, it's Australopithecus. When Meave and her colleagues saw Kenyanthropus, they said, this is something different. We'll call it Kenyanthropus. Everybody uses Kenyanthropus. I haven't seen anybody sink Kenyanthropus into Australopithecus yet. Uh, Tim White described a taxon known as Australopithecus ramidus, and then in what has to be the strangest core agendum ever in nature, uh, changed the name to Artipithecus ramidus, and now it's recognized everybody, by everybody in every phylogenetic chart that you see as Artipithecus. This gives us a sense of diversity in the late Miocene, early Pliocene, which I think we're missing by lumping everything into the same group. So I would just like to talk about plates and cups and mugs. Carol? I'd just like to add that um, it is interesting, or what makes cups and mugs and plates interesting is the implications that they have for understanding the biology of the animals that we're trying to put into some sort of context for how we evolved and where we came from. By assigning different fossils into cups and mugs and saucers, and then doing what Bill talked about is putting these things into lineages, that's where we're going to get our biologic information. Because the information about the biology, we can tell some things from looking at the skull and seeing what bumps and grooves are bigger or smaller. But where we get the most information about how natural selection shaped the different species that we see is by figuring out where the lineages are and seeing the transformation of change that may or may not have taken place. Now, that is completely, of course, dependent upon, first of all, whether it's a cup or a mug or a plate, second of all, which cup gave rise to which other cup, but that's the information that the biology really comes from. And I think it's particularly important to think about these issues of species diversity, about reconstructing lineages in a biologic context, because whether or not I personally care if it's Paranthropus or Australopithecus doesn't much matter. What matters is the implications of that for understanding evolution and for reconstructing the behavior of these animals and what is important biologically in terms of natural selection. What caused some individuals to leave more surviving offspring than others, which resulted in that pattern of evolutionary change that we heard about this morning. So whether or not some of you are out there thinking about who cares, what is this Pithecus or that Pithecus, I think the important thing to think about is we all have to think about it if we're going to understand what these animals were like and therefore how everything took place. And so I think as we're thinking about diversity, we need to remember that it's the biologic implications that are at stake here with all of this. Dave? Uh, just to follow up on the same point, uh, Fred and I had joked before the session that we were going to try and make the same point. Um, but he's done it first, so uh, let me try and adjust. Um, I think names do matter. Um, because, not because of some fetish about um, sorting things into groups and, and, you know, knowing these things fit together with those things. I think they matter because they shape our perceptions and understandings of what happened in biology. Um, and so, for instance, the name Australopithecus has shaped the activities of this conference. We've been told, oh, we're going to talk about Australopithecus, and most people um, here have some notion of what Australopithecus is, and they have shaped their discussion um, of the, the, the evolutionary history of our own uh, ancestors accordingly centered around that particular group. And, you know, I share with Fred a skepticism about whether or not that group is really a real thing. And by calling all of those, these different fossil species that we found, by calling all of them Australopithecus, it perpetuates this notion that these things are all really a natural group. They, they, they're, they're a group of organisms that logically go together, that share certain qualities, um, that we can characterize as a group. And I, I just am not convinced that that's really true. And I think there is more diversity out there. And it's cumbersome and sometimes a pain to, to, to not call everything Australopithecus, to give them other names. It, it becomes difficult to remember what they all are. But that actually provides information. If all of these things were not called Australopithecus, if they were divided into different groups, that would give us information knowing that, oh, these things are not all the same group. We should not think of them all collectively as if they were a natural unit. Um, and so I hope that is one thing that um, will be discussed um, going forward through the workshop. Good. Zerai? Um, uh, just just to, to say that, uh, of course, the, the names are uh, important because when we refer to a name as Australopithecus or Paranthropus, we are conveying uh, some message. And uh, I think the, the answer to that will anyway, whatever 
this uh, species are mugs or cups come come, will come from how uh, from the fossils that are they, they, the, the problem is derived from because the, the sample that we have is so limited as put uh, elegantly by Kimball. Uh, what we have is only part of the distribution. So the answer will, of course, uh, come from ana more analysis and more, 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 uh, more fossils. But since we are here to talk about Australopithecus, in my view, one of the take-home messages about Australopithecus is that uh, Australopithecus plays, uh, it's not just uh, an entity out there uh, with no purpose. It's a, it's a, it's a taxon that plays a, an important role in our understanding of how we became what we are today because it's a critically positioned pivotal transitional species between what we, what we call as the very early hominins such as Silentropus, Ardipithecus, etc., and what comes later, Homo. So the fact that this species is placed morphologically, behaviorally, temporally in a very critical uh, place makes it critical and uh, we need to uh, keep in mind that uh, Australopithecus uh, continues to play a major role in our understanding of uh, what we are. Thank you. And I'll just jump in here with, uh, I guess, not exactly defending the use of Australopithecus as a broad term, but perhaps refocusing uh, what I think the important terminology is. Um, I, uh, the points that Fred and Dave made about whether it's a real biological group or not, I, I certainly agree with them that every analysis so far has suggested that it's not a biological group in the same way that humans, chimpanzees, and gorillas form a biological group. But I'm not sure we're ever going to know or not know soon the exact relationships to the taxa well enough to start assigning uh, meaningful generic names. And it would be very difficult for me to teach, for example, if I was changing the names uh, very frequently based on changing interpretations of uh, how they're related to each other. So that's my practical reason for using the name. But I think the names that absolutely matter are the species names. And Fred was talking about uh, perhaps a reluctance in our field to recognize diversity. And this is uh, a difficult one because it's the very first thing that everyone does when they find a new fossil is they give it a name, usually a new species name. But that's the point at which we know the least about the, the new species or the new set of fossils. And as we go through time looking at how the species names are interpreted, you learn more and more about them. Um, from my own experience working with Africanus, the more the sample size has grown, the more difficult it has become to actually try to determine whether there's one species that's dark contained or two or three, mainly because you start to see all kinds of com complex variation posing the challenge of understanding how much variation really occurs within species, what are the patterns of variation, and how can you really tell uh, the, di the difference between a one species model and a two species model or other more complex scenarios. And I think even though this is a very basic question, the separation of this within species variation from between species differences is going to pose us a major challenge for many years. And I think ultimately we'll learn a lot more about the biology of the species as we go through that process. But I do think in the end that the species unit is, is substantially more real than the genus and definitely it's worth focusing attention on those names. Whereas the genus name is perhaps uh, certainly a very interesting question. What does it mean? What is it supposed to mean? But I'm not sure it has the same impact uh, that the species names do. Um, I, I come at this I sort of very different perspective from everyone else here. I, I don't do sort of morphology of fossils. I, um, and you know, Professor Kimball said that it's not all about arranging fossils from early to late. Um, it's about how they connect. But unless we have some understanding of the chronology of these things, and that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, there was a lot about time depth in these talks about gaps in the fossil record, um, and this has particularly been difficult between looking at material in eastern and then southern Africa. Southern Africa has and still has a lot of problems with the dating um, of a lot of the fossils and trying to understand how east and south um, relate and therefore relations of different species or sort of uh, lineages between those two regions is, is, is still quite difficult. Um, what I think we're beginning to see is that um, there is some possibilities for doing this. We now have for example, the Makapanshat fossils are nearly three million years old and some of the Stokefontein material is nearly two. Um, so we now have sort of like 
two uh, samples within that same potential lineages of Africanus to compare, um, similar to the sorts of things that they showed for the Hadar material. Um, so we're beginning to make progress in southern Africa, which is quite nice. Um, I suppose the other thing that struck me is that often you see these talks and uh, the sort of thing that I do with geochronology is often um, taken down to the base thing of just like a little squiggly line and then two little digits that suggest this fossil is 2.1 million or 3.3 or million. Um, it's a lot more difficult than that. Often that's a sort of, there's a much bigger age range and I suppose the public often see these fossils as given these, dis these exact ages um, without maybe understanding the idea that it's a lot more complicated um, and that's something that is continuously obviously being worked on um, as, as well as looking at the morphology of this material. So. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I have, I have a cold. But uh, I, I, one thing that uh, struck me when I was listening to talks this morning, I've just changed gears here a little bit, is uh, thinking about the, some of the slides that people show, the phylogenetic trees, and I thought perhaps one interesting exercise might be for everybody to dig out all their old phylogenetic trees and start to compare them because it's, I, I thought, especially when Bill was talking, that uh, we have these, you know, points where we have question marks and I think if we go back in sort of people's previous talks from, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, wonder where those question marks were and I think that people have been working very hard to fill in those gaps, but every time we fill in one gap, it seems like it creates a dozen new question marks. So I think that uh, maybe it's because uh, as scientists, we try and come up with an explanation to fit all the facts that we have, and that explanation is usually we say, think, well, let's try and keep it simple, let's try and not you know, make up too much stuff. Let's try and just account for what we see. And that means that we have, if you have two fossils, you have one older, one younger, then you draw a line between them and there you have a lineage. And then as you get more fossils, it's like, wow, this doesn't quite fit in my lineage. And you start to expand and get more complicated. And I think the bottom line is that probably the evolutionary history of our family, our, our uh, heritage is much more complicated than we ever thought in the beginning. And uh, it's never going to be the case that we're going to get rid of all those question marks, uh, even if we find every fossil that ever was to be found. Okay. Um, just to follow up on that point, actually, I'm, I'm glad you raised that, because um, it is true that I think there's a tendency, particularly in forums like this, to say that, oh, my gosh, these relationships are co so complicated and there are all these question marks that we, we don't know how these things relate to each other. And it, it is certainly true that there's not absolute agreement among everybody in the field about exactly how these things relate to each other. But I think the idea that we don't know anything about how these species are related to each other is, um, is not true, that that's actually an exaggeration. And I, I bet that actually the basic frame, <laughs> I had this experience talking to my, um, my undergraduate advisor who works, his name's David Pilbin, who works on Miocene apes. And I went to visit him sometime after I'd gone to graduate school and I was working on phylogeny, which means these pattern of evolutionary relationships. And he sat me down and said, you know, ah, oh, you guys, you work in hominids. Yeah, you know, it, we don't really understand what's going on in hominids, just, just sort of sorting out some of the details. Now, Miocene apes, that's really difficult. Um, and that sort of struck me as sort of very odd because that's not the way people usually think about it. But I bet actually that we could all sit down in a room and come to agreements um, about uh, many aspects of how these species are related to each other and then identify areas where there is not agreement or where there is um, uncertainty. And I bet the instances of uncertainty are actually um, s focused around just a few species um, and how they fit into the overall general pattern. So I'm actually much more optimistic about what we know or what we might know about um, uh, evolutionary relationships between species. Good. Um, to add something on that, um, as far as names are concerned and naming species, either we give or we come up with different species. To me, um, I feel like we are dealing with many interests or we have different interests. We have to deal, as Richard said in introduction, we are dealing with the public, we are dealing with 
scientists among ourselves. And the way I see it, um, I'm not old in the field, but people are beginning to appreciate that names, they are important, but what is important is the patterns we are seeing in, in evolution, in, in behavior, adaptation. And people are starting to ask this important question about what was happening within this time. So we realize name is important, and when we are dealing with the public, that's when it becomes a problem, and probably when we are announcing. But in, within the scientific community, what we are asking when we think, for example, in terms of paleoclimate, is what was happening in this period. And if you follow maybe in the workshop that is coming up, people are starting to ask, what was the effect of, or the local effect, or regional effect? Because if you look at other fauna, even in a small area or a small site, you realize there are patterns and um, diversity in, 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 in the fauna you find. So I think it's an issue, it's like a seesaw. It comes like this and you feel, well, how do you deal with the names? But at the back of our minds, hopefully many of us, we are interested with what is happening in general behavior at this particular time and when we move to this time, what are we seeing? And how does this connect to the whole issue about environment, about climate? That's my own perception and um, I think it's... Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think now I'll open it up to the members of the audience. You people have been sitting quietly for several hours now. Um, if people would like to ask questions, either of the panelists up here or of some of this morning's speakers, we will get microphones to the appropriate folks. Just raise your hand and we'll get you a microphone. Uh, you yeah, someone right in the middle. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Since the object of uh, a lot of this seems to be um, an understanding of human evolution, I was wondering if the different projected lineages give rise to different explanations for uh, human evolution, um, at least in, in the time period covered by the Australopithecines, if I can use that term. Um, so is there some discussion of alternative models of human evolution based on the evidence that you've seen? David, you want to talk about that or, or Bill? Um, I guess uh, what I would say is that there are almost certainly different lineages of these early humans living during this time period, and I think what we can discern is that each of those lineages may have been experiencing different selective pressures that have led to adaptation perhaps going in different directions. Um, some of them, uh, uh, you know, uh, for instance, the robust australopithecines um, uh, uh, perhaps it is, we will learn more about australopithecines uh, and their diet, um, and perhaps robust australopithecines are not the exact focus of what we're talking about today, but these are um, animals that develop these massive teeth and huge chewing muscles, and, and perhaps they're related to um, eating very resistant um, food items um, as a dietary strategy, perhaps, perhaps for surviving during periods of seasonal scarcity. Um, and at the same time that that is going on in that lineage, there's a con contemporaneous lineage um, of early members of the genus Homo um, that are adapting, uh, that are adopting a different adaptive strategy. Their brains are getting bigger. Their faces and teeth are becoming smaller. Um, possibly mean that they're and these things are living perhaps in the same environment, but are are taking different evolutionary trajectories, perhaps different strategies um, for dealing with those environmental problems. Um, ultimately, one of those lineages goes extinct. The other one survives. That doesn't necessarily mean that the one the strategy that the, the lineage that went extinct chose poorly, um, but, um, but there are certainly different lineages and we can identify different evolutionary trajectories that take place in each one of those. I'm not sure if that's the same thing as a different theory of evolution, um, but different things are happening in different lineages. Uh, can I actually jump in to follow up Dave's point? Of course, of course. Um, another way of looking at it, this is actually follows up mostly on Bill's talk, he could perhaps speak, speak to this, but in terms of the general way in which uh, human ancestors were evolving, I think the most um, the lineage that Bill talked about, the 1.2 million year long lineage between Anamensis and Afrensis, has relatively profound uh, consequences for the way we understand 
how evolution was taking place at that time. Um, because it basically suggests that in this region of Africa, there was a, uh, a large population that was evolving, not necessarily at a steady pace, but certainly going through uh, periods of change on a fairly regular basis, so that a million, through a million years of time, you end up with something completely different. But during that time, there is no profound change in the environment. And there might be some changes that we can identify towards the end of that lineage that would suggest, that would connect to certain of the um, events of evolutionary change within Afarensis. But in terms of a general explanation related to habitat change that would tell us why Anamensis was changing into Afarensis, I don't think we have it. So it suggests a model of evolution that um, we certainly need to, well, perhaps a case study of evolution that can probably tell us the mechanism for how this was happening in much greater detail than in places where the dates are not nearly as refined or the samples are not as big. Any other questions out here in the audience? It's a quiet lot. Sure, Bill. You can come up here, sure. <laughs> Got to stand in front of the camera. Um, just to, just to follow follow on that and and answer the question about human evolution, there there are some hypotheses out there that suggest actually that the robust Australopiths in spite of their pervasive level of specialization in their teeth and their jaw structures and so forth, actually have features that are shared uniquely with us in this room that are otherwise very ape-like and primitive in all the other Australopiths. And some hypotheses actually suggest that the robust Australopith group and early Homo shared a common ancestor, which would be very unusual to think about given how different we are from them if we compare the end members of the two lineages. But if that were true, and I'm not insisting that it is, it constrains the time and place, potentially, of the origins of the Homo lineage in a way that other hypotheses that allow a much earlier different origin for the Homo lineage uh, to take place. So depending on how we connect the dots in these phylogenies, we can actually constrain explanations as to the, the pattern of evolution of uniquely human characteristics and the when and the where as well. So the con making a consensus statement on the tree is critically important for understanding the processes underlying the driving uh, factors behind the, the adaptations that we see in the record. And that's because it says a lot about time and place. Okay. Thanks. Is there a question over here? Yes. Camilla? There's, there's been some progress um, in the area of dinosaurs getting uh, genetic material. Has there been any progress in the area of early hominids? I don't have a lot of geneticists here. Anyone want to just? What do you tell your undergraduates, Charles? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I mean, you know, as you if you read as you know from the newspapers, they're apparently making extraordinary progress. Uh, in sequ sequencing the Neanderthal genome. As far as I know, I don't know of much that's ever been discovered beyond that. You're, you're in a well, part of genetics. I, I come from the Max Planck, maybe I can add some, some points on this. They're trying to come up with a Neanderthal genome and they're sequencing fossils uh, as of today, as I know, up to maybe 100,000 years. They are trying to, but uh, uh, they're successful so far up to 50,000 years. So it's, there, there are some progresses, but as far as Australopithecus afarensis, uh, sorry, I'm biased. As far as Australopithecus is concerned, there is uh, no uh, DNA or no other organic material that can be exploited in this regard. In uh, talking about the naming, the uh, Kenyanthropus, it, it does have a different name. And I'm assuming it's put in the Australopithecus discussion here because it's uh, tooth size, body size, brain size. But I'm wondering, um, I guess the flat face makes it a uh, different genus. What's the story? If, if you can hold off till this afternoon, our first talk this afternoon will be by Meve Leakey, who I think will address that. Um, I mean, it was mentioned here, but I think we'll give me her chance this afternoon, if you don't mind. 
Other questions over here? Yes, right there in the red. Mark, can you get oh, the sorry. personal mic? Was there, uh, did they find an orthopithecus species in Lake Shad? If so, how, did, how is it related to the other species that you talked about today? Someone want to talk about the fossils from Chad? The Chad, the Brunei's fossils from yeah. Chad, the Australopithecus from Chad. Does anyone want to? Yeah, you've talked about it. David? Oh, oh okay, <laughs> right. You're our talker today. Certainly. Um, Sure, there uh, is an early hominid from Chad that's perhaps seven million years old, six and a half million years old. Um, it has some unusual uh, facial characteristics, um, a small brain, and based on a reconstruction of the skull, um, again, it looks like the foramen magnum, which is the hole on the bottom of the skull through which your spinal cord exit, it looks like it faces down. And so the inference is that this thing walked upright and was a biped. I, I think this is actually a great example of um, names and why they matter. Um, uh, this conference is about Australopithecus, and we've been talking about things living between 4.2 million years ago up till about one and a half million years ago. And, uh, and you know, we talk about these things as being Australopithecines or Australopiths or, or this group of animals. Um, and I'm sort of surprised that actually we're not talking about these earlier things in that same general body of things, group uh, of organisms that we call Australopiths. Um, I don't know. I mean, it. it it's, it's a biped. It doesn't have um, uh, as big teeth as you see later on um, uh, in these things that we're calling Australopithecus. Um, presumably its diet is not exactly the same, perhaps. Um, but there is some suggestion that there are some dental features in it that, that perhaps are, represent the early stages of a trend um, eventually leading towards um, Australopithecines later on. So yes, uh, currently the material from Chad is the earliest evidence we have of something that we consider a, a bipedal hominid. But there is a fossil from Chad, an Australopithecus species from Chad. Bar oh, Barl Ghazali. Oh, duh. Sorry. Sorry. There, yeah. You, you know, I always overlook that one. There's a, there's a, you want to do it? Yeah. No, I just said you flunked the test. I flunked the test. I have to, <laughs> he was my advisor, so I have to um, revoke my, um, my PhD. There, there is a, a small mandible and a, and, a, and a tooth also from Chad that's about three and a half million years old. Um, it's been allocated to a new species, Australopithecus baral ghazali. It, it, it's fragmentary stuff. I don't, I'm not sure if there's complete consensus about whether or not it is really anatomically warrants being a different species or if it should be lumped in with the stuff currently called baral ghazali. I think the best thing that we can say about it is that we don't actually know very much about it other than it's in Chad. Other questions? You probably must be getting hungry. Oh, yes. It seems you uh, make a lot of predictions on a small sample size, and then you, you speak a lot about variability and all. And all those things go back to statistics and mathematics, and uh, uh, mathematicians and uh, statisticians employ to a great extent than what you do. Well, uh, fortunately, the uh, methods, um, methods of statistics play a larger and larger role in uh, determining exactly how to interpret variation. Uh, the somewhat depressing thing is that they do often show us that conclusions on small sample sizes have been overzealous. Um, and they often, they sometimes show us, getting back to the point I was making earlier, that if you assume a group of fossils is one species, it's often very difficult to reject that hypothesis. But if you assume that it's two, it's often very difficult to reject that hypothesis as well. So in other words, if you don't have any, uh, any prior basis for knowing how many species might be in a sample, you can find it's very difficult to form a hypothesis that, is actually, that actually gains more statistical support than another one. So this is a particular problem in the field, but it, it's certainly true that the methods are, are being used on a regular basis. And, and most studies of these types of questions do involve more and more high-powered statistics um, every year. So hopefully over, the, over time it'll give us the appropriate amount of caution, but also possibly indicate uh, some more important co conclusions about, again, how the species were varying and what that tells us about uh, differences between males and females, changes through time, all the things we want to know in, to in order to understand uh, species biology. Any questions out there? Oh, uh, Bill wants another rebuttal. 
the, uh, as Charlie says, sample size, and as the question implies, sample size is an incredibly important factor in everything we do. But one historical note, if you look back in the history of paleoanthropology, how many species have been named, there's been an enormous number. But many of them, by no means all, but many of them, which are recognized based on just a few teeth or a jaw or an infant skull in the case of Australopithecus africanus, they turn out to be right. You know, you look at Homo erectus, or Homo neanderthalensis, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus or Paranthropus robustus, which was recognized on a, a jaw and a one partial cranium. We do sample parts of the distribution, and we often go into the fossil record with the idea that we're sampling the distribution near the mean, which is what we hope for. And I think more often than not, we do. And there are some cases where we don't. But I think the history of recognizing species in paleoanthropology says we do a pretty good job at it, even with small samples. Uh, yes, right in the middle. Could you please pass this down? I, uh, I'm a high school science teacher, and if I could say one thing, uh, I would like to say that there probably aren't enough science teachers here as there should be. What I would like to know is what we can do to get more high school science teachers here. This is right in our backyard, and what can we do to actually get more teachers here? Because ultimately, I feel as a science teacher that it's my job to get students interested in science and evolution in general. Thank you. What can we do, though, to get more science teachers here and educate ourselves so that we could bring this wonderful information into the classroom? Well, partly that's an advertising problem here. We, we did sell this one out, but we would love to have another thousand people here. Perhaps if there's a, there must be some Long Island science teachers organization or something, perhaps, that we can get a mailing list from and, and keep them aware of the ongoing stuff. Because a lot happens at this university. And, oh, I'm sorry, in the microphone. So, you know, if, if there's some, some organization of, of Long Island science teachers or something, people who could conceivably make it in a, in a day, you know, we'd be happy to uh, send out a mailing to everybody. Uh, we do our best to advertise these things, and, and we sell them out every year, but we'd be more than happy to move into Stoller Center with three times the seating if we could uh, get the word out to even more people. And we, yes, we have a lot more plans in, in, in progress. Uh, we have a, a rather modest website now for this, the Turkana Basin Institute and for the Human Evolution Workshops. But the Turkana Basin Institute um, is currently working with the National Geographic Society to develop a tremendous web portal of, of all sorts of outreach efforts, uh, just basic information and probably various courses and all sorts of things to, to spread the word. So in addition to getting people here, we're hoping to get a lot more information about human evolution out to people who couldn't make it in a, in a day trip. Other, other questions? Yes, Charlie. Uh, I think I just want to make a comment on what you just said. Sure. Uh, in Kenya, we are also uh, trying to reach out with many students uh, through the Priesthood Club of Kenya. Uh, we are trying to reach out to as many students through the, uh, through the country, and we do uh, this through, through uh, lectures at the National Museums of Kenya. Uh, recently, we held a teacher's workshop that brought uh, together teachers from across the country uh, because we believe that a single teacher will be able to reach, reach out to as many students uh, as possible. So we also really, we, I, I know there's, there's a, a similar problem here in the U.S., uh, such as the one that we have in Kenya, but we are trying as much as possible to reach out to as many Kenyans, particularly uh, high school students and also university students. Uh, and recently, as I said, we, we reached out to very many teachers. We got some money from uh, the Wenner Green Foundation, and through that we brought teachers from across the country to Nairobi, mm -hmm. uh, and we discussed issues on prehistory. And we do hope that uh, this particular information is going to, to filter down to the students. Thank you, yes. The, Dr. Manthe's done extraordinary work with the prehistory clubs in Kenya in, in spreading the word of the tremendous resources in Kenya and encountering the kind of problems that Richard runs into. People. Uh, sorry, I'm not on the mic. Um, we have time for a couple more questions, or we can break for lunch. Is everybody? Yes. 
the man again. Okay. Uh, okay. As a person not in this field, a layman, I, I, Dr. Clark spoke about that uh, looking at the pelvis that the, the uh, species would walk upright, but not quite like us. But what is the geometry of walking upright? In other words, is it uh, dichotomous in, in two ways, or can somebody give me a simple explanation of uh, the categories of walking upright? Uh, once again, I think if you can hang in there till 3 o'clock this afternoon, uh, Dr. Stern, who's an expert on evolution of human walking, will, will try to address your questions and talk about this in more detail. Will you be here this afternoon? Yes. Good. <laughs> yes. Okay, yeah, we hope so. Uh, over here on the far side. Uh, just a question about the recent paper in Nature where a habilis was found uh, at a higher level than the erectus. Doesn't that really suggest that everything is a lot more complex than we may think? Me, would you care to elaborate on your recent paper? Yeah, we're getting your microphone. This is Dr. Meve Leakey who you'll here talking earlier, later this afternoon, right after lunch. Um, I think, as Richard pointed out this morning, there was a lot of misinformation by the media on this um, specimen. And in fact, it doesn't, it isn't, um, we had a Homo erectus specimen, but also a part of a jaw of a Homo habilis that's dated at 1.44 million. And that's younger than Homo habilis had been recognized in the fossil record before. So it just illustrated that Homo habilis and Homo erectus were living at the same time for half a million years. Previously, this had been recognized by a number of people, but they'd never had a really good um, limits on the, on the younger age for Homo habilis. But Homo erectus continues long after that. Um, that 1.44 is the latest date that we have for Homo habilis. So, th so um, this interpretation, everyone said, we're changing things and making things upside down. In fact, we weren't doing anything like that at all. We were just extending the range of Homo habilis as opposed to saying um, that one evolved into another. And it's just, I think it's really got into the textbooks and things like that, that Homo habilis is ancestral to Homo erectus. Whereas a number of people have actually said in print and have published papers, and Bill Kimball, I think, was maybe the first person to do that saying that Homo habilis is definitely living contemporaneously with Homo erectus. So I hope that clarifies for everybody. Okay, well, I think we've had a pretty good morning and I think if we can go back to, to Richard's conversation with Steve Jobs, it's pretty clear that I think paleoanthropology is still progressing on lots of fronts, both, both lots of new fossils coming out of the ground and out of the caves, and lots and lots of new analytical techniques and new sophisticated both statistical and geological methods coming into play to help us make more sense of the stuff we're finding. This will continue this afternoon. We'll have another round of speakers and a panel discussion followed by a reception out here behind the, the Wong Center where you'll have a chance to actually talk to people and ask further questions if you're too shy to raise your hand in here. Uh, it's about 12.15 now. We're due to start again at 1.40. Uh, there's lunch available for those of you who have reserved. And again, when you come in this afternoon, realize we're still sold out. So sort of move to the centers, give everybody a space. And thank you for your attention all morning. We'll see you in about an hour and a half. Thank you.